Okay, good morning um, and welcome to EIA's Winter Fuels Outlook webinar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Hannah Bruhl and I'm the team lead for short-term integrated products in the Office of Energy Analysis at EIA. As most of you know, EIA is the independent statistical agency within the Department of Energy. Our mission is to provide independent and impartial data and analysis that can be used by industry, policymakers, researchers, and others to better understand how energy markets function and in turn make more informed decisions. Um, before I go over today's agenda, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on EIA's website and YouTube page following the event. <clears throat> to avoid background noise, all attendees have been placed on mute. Um, there will be a Q&A period following the presentations and you can submit your questions at any time using the chat function in the WebEx control panel. Please make sure you direct your questions to all panelists to ensure we see them. With that said, let's turn to today's agenda. The EIA's Winter Fuels Outlook is our annual look at expectations for consumption and prices for heating fuels in the upcoming winter. We provide a wide range of data and forecast that provide useful indicators of energy market conditions at the national, regional, and in some cases, state level. In the Winter Fuels Outlook, we try to take these indicators from a broad geographic areas and combine them with the detailed household data we get from our RECs to put our forecasts in terms that are more relatable for average consumers and help people understand the heating costs they could face in the upcoming winter. So first, we will begin with Dave, Dr. David DeWitt, the Director of Climate Prediction Center at NOAA, who will share their winter weather forecast. Um, then we will hear from EIA Administrator, Dr. Joe DeCarlos, who will discuss our winter fuels outlook. Um, and then we'll turn to Rusty Brazil, the CEO and Principal Energy Markets Consultant for RBN Energy, who will share his outlook on market dynamics to watch as we head into this winter. Then, following Rusty's remarks, our speakers will be joined by a panel of EIA experts and we'll open the floor to answer your questions. So we look forward to hearing from you. Now, to get this morning's, pro this morning's program started, I will hand things over to David. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna stay uh, with no video. I'm actually in a hotel uh, in Omaha on travel. So. First, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, as noted, I'm Dave DeWitt from the NOAA National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center. Next slide. So my talk will cover four topics. First, I'm going to give some background on the seasonal outlooks. Next, I will discuss the major climate drivers impacting U.S. winter on these timescales. Then I will cover the tools used to generate the winter outlook. Finally, I'll give the actual outlook. Next slide, please. So seasonal outlooks are probabilistic and they're given in a tercile format with three categories, below normal, near normal, and above normal. And these are for the mean for temperature and for the median for precipitation. Next slide. So this is just an example and I apologize, it's actually wrong <laughs> slides I sent. Um, so I'll just correct that for you. So. When you look at the maps, the maps are the dominant category. Uh, and so in this case, the example I'm highlighting there on the left, um, the below normal there should be 43%, not 33%. My apologies on that omission or that uh, mistake. And so the, the map gives you the dominant category. We have tools that uh, you can go to interactively and click on it. And that would show you what the uh, three categories are for your particular location. And um, precipitation outlooks are a similar format. Next slide. So our outlooks are issued each month on the third Thursday. And with each release of the outlooks, we issue forecasts for the upcoming 13 seasons. Our next outlook is gonna be issued next Thursday, October 20th, and the final winter outlook will be issued on November 17th. Next slide. So now I'm gonna briefly cover the potential large scale climate drivers that impact US winter uh, climate. Next slide. 
So the diamond, dominant climate signal, excuse me, impacting U.S. winter temperature is the El Nino, La Nina phenomena, and the other is the trend. Uh, we have reasonable skill in predicting both El Nino, La Nina, as well as the trend. There are other important phenomena, however, that impact uh, seasonal temperatures over the U.S., such as the Arctic Oscillation, uh, or sudden stratospheric warmings, and those are not predictable, unfortunately, beyond about a two-week lead, given current state of the science. Next slide. So both dynamical and statistical tools are known to have skill on this time scale, which is quite different than weather. Uh, on the weather time scale, say out to seven days, only dynamical models are currently used. Statistical models are not competitive, at least not yet. That may change with artificial intelligence, machine learning. The tools that we use that we have a confidence in because of a certain skill level are combined objectively into a consolidation based on their historical skill with higher skill models getting more weight. That's based on a historical period of approximately 30 years. The consolidation serves as a starting point for the forecasters who make the forecasts. Next slide. So in terms of some major modes of variability, again, this is one that you'll sometimes hear in the news, uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation or the Arctic Oscillation. Sometimes they'll refer to this as the polar vortex. That represents the high latitude circulation pattern, which influences the number and intensity of cold air outbreaks. And again, the point I want to emphasize is that unfortunately that is not predictable beyond about two weeks at this time. Next slide. So this, this figure shows the recent variability of the Arctic Oscillation in winter, just, just for reference. Next slide. So now I'm going to talk uh, about a high level overview of the tools that were used to generate the winter outlook. These are the uh, aspects of the climate system that we actually have confidence in and can predict with some skill. Next slide. So the first is the current state of the El Nino La Nina. Currently we are in a La Nina state and we expect to, that to continue through the winter uh, with a probability of about 54% through March. And uh, we've been in a La Nina for over two years now. Uh, this will be the third year of La Nina conditions through a winter, assuming that that actually verifies, which we're pretty confident it will. Uh, and that is highly unusual. And um, this is having large scale impacts across the globe, including drought. As I mentioned before, I'm in a hotel, I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, record low levels here on the local rivers, um, as well as uh, massive drought uh, in the west coast of the U.S. that you all have probably seen in the news as well. Next slide. So next we look at the predicted evolution of the La Nina. La Nina conditions are expected to continue through the winter, here being December, January, February with a 65 percent probability. So again, higher probability earlier in the year. We're expecting a fairly rapid transition out of these La Nina conditions, as you can see from these forecasts. Hopefully that will prove true, given all the negative impacts associated with this extended La Nina, multiple events. Next slide. Oh, next slide. Great, thanks. So the, the La Nina state information is used to inform statistic, simple statistical tools called composites that compute the average response for previous events. Here I'm showing the combined typical impact of La Nina conditions and trend on temperature for winter over the U.S. Next slide. Oh, we're... Okay, you, you say where you are. I'll catch up. So CPC also uses a tool called the Optimal Climate Normals for computing the short-term trend. Uh, this, this case, it's a 15-year trend. And uh, I will catch myself up. So this is the most recent trend forecast using this optimal climate normals tool. And this is for the winter again, DJF 2223. Next slide. So the winter outlook relies heavily on dynamical models, specifically the North American multi-model ensemble, which has contributions from NOAA, NASA, NCAR, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. And these models are calibrated to have the correct historical probabilistic distribution. Next slide. So this is the NMME, oh, you have to hit it one more time, sorry. Thank you. 
so this is uh, this is the calibrated NMME forecast for the upcoming winter that we used for producing this outlook. Next slide. So then, as I mentioned before, we use an objective skill weighted tool known as a consolidation. Um, there are other terminologies used. Uh, a blend sometimes is a common one. And it combines the previously mentioned tools uh, to produce a single product that is serves as the first guess or initial conditions that the forecasters use to make the outlook. Next slide. So this is the consolidation for the coming winter. And looking at that, it clearly favors the La Nina composite with somewhat less weight for the other tools. This is a fairly classic temperature response to a La Nina event. Next slide. Okay, great, thanks. And so uh, now I'm actually gonna give the 22-23 US winter outlook. So in summary, given the current La Nina conditions that are expe expected, excuse me, to persist through the winter, we are expecting a typical or canonical La Nina response in temperature. As I just showed, the multi-tool consolidation, which was used as the first guess, is strongly reflecting the La Nina conditions. These outlooks are going to evolve over the winter as the forcing functions evolve. So for instance, if we see a much more rapid um, transition away from the La Nina conditions, that will have a significant impact on the forecast. If we see, um, on the other hand, the La Nina conditions intensifying, that will also have an impact on the forecast. If we have a sudden stratospheric warming, uh, that could have an impact as well. The predictability of that, again, is going to be on a, on a shorter time scale. But once it's there, then it will uh, certainly have a, an impact on the temperature signal over the U.S. So given the fact that there is going to be potential for some of these signals to change based on what we're seeing um, for current conditions, I recommend that you check back every month. Our outlooks are updated on the third Thursday on our website. Next slide. So this is the December, January, February DJF outlook for temperature. So it calls for enhanced probability of above normal temperature along much of the southern tier and along the east coast. There is a much smaller region where below normal temperature is favored in the northwest and north central part of the country. Oh, uh, next slide. Oh, I've I've lost the video. Oh, there you go. Great, thanks. Sorry, I apologize. As I said, I'm in a hotel. Um, so this figure shows the average temperature departure of the middle value of the distribution for winter. So you can see what the temperature anomalies are expected to be for the upcoming winter. And again, this also will be updated every third Thursday. Next slide. So this figure shows the winter precipitation outlook, which calls for an enhanced probability of below normal precipitation along the southern tier and for California, and an enhanced probability of above normal precipitation for parts of Idaho and Montana and the Ohio Valley. So thanks for the opportunity to speak. That's all I have for today. Thanks, David. Um, really appreciate it. Um, as a reminder to everybody, you know, please feel free to submit any questions you have into the chat and direct those to all panelists. So we'll be queuing those up. Um, next up, we're going to hear from EIA Administrator Dr. Joe DeCarlis. Thank you, Joe. Hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Before I dive in, I, I just wanted to emphasize that this analysis is really the work of a, a large team of expert analysts at EIA, and as the administrator, it, it's my honor to be able to present um, the results. I also want to say uh, at the top that we recognize that given the current high levels of uncertainty and volatility in energy markets, that our projections really speak to important pocketbook issues for families uh, across the country. Next. Okay, I wanted to start off with uh, findings. So our winter fuels outlook covers four fuels, as you can see in the chart here, natural gas, electricity, propane, and heating oil. Uh, and we also test the uh, household expenditures to different winter temperatures. And so that's why you see the range in the bars in the figure here. And I'm gonna explain these, 
this result in a lot more detail later on. But right now, I just want to focus on the high level findings, which is that winter energy expenditures for most households are likely to be higher than they were last winter. Those expenditures could be much higher if the weather is, is very cold. And inventories for natural gas and uh, fuel oil are starting the winter he heating season uh, relatively low, and that's going to exert upward pressure on prices and, and could mean uh, uh, some volatility. Next slide. Just wanted to uh, provide some key notes and definitions. So unlike NOAA that defines winter as uh, December, January, February, we're looking at the winter heating season, which runs October through March. Uh, and we're quantifying the total bill by fuel type, not just for heating. So for example, when you see household expenditures for electricity, that's not just electricity for space heating, that's electricity to meet all uh, end use demand. So including lighting and appliances. Um, we use our residential energy consumption survey, which is a detailed survey of the residential sector to quantify baseline household energy consumption by fuel type. And then we, in order to produce this uh, outlook, we use our short term integrated forecasting system, which is uh, basically an econometric model that has some external inputs uh, relating to, for example, to weather and macroeconomic assumptions. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of the, the NOAA forecast, we incorporate that into our forecast as well. Uh, weather is a, is a really important variable, and um, what we've done on this slide is translated changes in uh, average winter temperatures into heating degree days, which is a proxy for, for heating demand. So you can see uh, data over the last decade. The red dots represent the NOAA forecast at the beginning of the uh, the winter season, the bars represent sensitivity around that forecast. So we increase the heating degree days by 10% to represent a colder winter. We also decrease the heating degree days by 10% to represent a milder winter. And then the, the dark line that you see there with the diamond markers represents the actual uh, heating degree days that we've uh, experienced over the last several years. And you can see that it generally falls within this plus minus uh, 10% range, which is why we we choose that uh, for our, our sensitivity cases. The final point I want to make is that if you compare the actual heating degree days from last winter, uh, so the diamond marker, to the red dot for this uh, upcoming winter, you can see that there's an increase in the heating degree days. So we're expecting that on a national average basis, we're going to ex experience a slightly colder winter uh, this year compared to last year, and that's going to increase uh, uh, consumption. Uh, next slide. I want to talk a little bit about the distribution of fuel use around the country. So if you look on the left hand side, this is showing the most prevalent home heating fuel by state. Uh, and it's it's really dominated by natural gas and electricity across most of the country. Although we do have a fair amount of heating oil in the, the Northeast, uh, which is denoted by that, by that brown color. On the right hand side, this is primary home heating fuel by state. Again, you can see the dominance of natural gas and electricity uh, across, across the United States. But uh, you can see that heating oil, again, is very important in the Northeast and that propane is also important uh, in many northern states. And I, I want to emphasize the importance of heating oil and propane because they're being used in some of the coldest parts of the country. And so we want to uh, carefully monitor those markets in, in particular. Next slide. Uh, another point is that for most fuels, residential consumption is concentrated in the winter. So for each of our winter heating fuels, uh, what we have here is a map, is, is a plot that shows uh, how much of that fuel is being consumed throughout the, the year. And you can see that for three out of the four fuels, we see a very clear uh, winter peak. So for example, with natural gas, 79% of the residential consumption of natural gas is taking place during the winter. For electricity, you can see that there's actually a dual peak. We do see a winter peak in electricity consumption, but there's also a summer peak, of course, due to higher air conditioning loads. 
Uh, for propane, again, very clear winter peak. 74% of the annual residential consumption of propane is taking place during the winter. And for fuel distillate fuel oil, 66% of the residential consumption is taking place during the, uh, the winter months. Uh, next slide. Okay, here we're looking at energy average energy expenditures by household, and we're looking over the last decade, and these represent ex household expenditures in, in real dollars. So we've removed the effects of inflation so that we can make a consistent comparison over a longer period of time. You can see the four heating fuels uh, that we're focused on in this outlook, and I just wanna call attention to the fact that we expect Compared to last winter, uh, natural gas price, uh, I'm sorry, natural gas expenditures to be up 21% and heating oil expenditures to be up 19%. And again, this is on a uh, nominal, uh, nominal basis. Next slide. So when we're talking about household expenditures, those expenditures are gonna be affected by the level of consumption within each household and, and also by the unit price associated with each fuel. And so here we're looking at the actual prices, the unit prices associated with each of these fuels. Because we're looking over several years, we're presenting this on a real basis. So again, we've removed the effects of inflation. Uh, we're also breaking down these prices on a, a regional basis. So they're being presented at the census region level. Uh, again, you can see that the unit price for natural gas compared to last winter is up significantly as it is for heating oil. With heating oil, uh, because it's largely concentrated in the Northeast, uh, we're presenting just the, the U.S. average uh, uh, trend here. For electricity and propane, the prices are relatively flat compared with uh, last winter. Next slide. Okay, so this is uh, one of the key slides. This is what I had showed on that finding slide, and I want to take some time to walk through this. So first thing I want to say is that weather is a pretty significant source of uncertainty in these forecasts. And if we take cold weather, for example, it can affect uh, household energy expenditures in a couple important ways. The first is if we have colder temperatures, it's going to increase the amount of energy we need in order to keep that house at a specific temperature. That the aggregate effect of that increased energy consumption can also lead to higher prices and, and that the combination of higher consumption and higher prices uh, can increase uh, ex, uh, these expenditures. Now, onto the figure itself, you can see the four fuels that we track, natural gas, electricity, propane, and heating oil. The vertical axis is showing average nominal winter household expenditures in dollars. And uh, the white dots represent our baseline forecast. The bars represent the range based on the different weather cases that I explained, basically plus minus 10% on the, the heating degree days. And then because we want to compare this with last winter, the percentages you see, uh, and if you look to the heating oil bar, we're showing the percent change in nominal terms uh, compared this winter compared with uh, last winter, okay? And what I wanna do here is step through each of these fuels uh, in descending order of, of that range. So we're gonna start with uh, propane here where you can see this really wide range. We could see anywhere from a 12% decrease in household expenditures compared to last winter to a 36% a increase. So with propane, uh, particularly in the Midwest, the demand is met primarily through inventories. Uh, and that the northern states where a lot of propane is used are particularly susceptible to very cold weather. And th that cold weather can really draw those inventories down and lead to big increases in spot prices. And importantly, those changes in wholesale prices can get passed on to consumers very quickly. Alternative supply options are costly and it takes time to re reach that region. And, and that's part of the reason why we see this, this large range in, in household expenditures. Moving on to heating oil, uh, the, the, the amount of heating oil uh, is a relatively small part of the overall distillate market. But again, it's predominantly used in the Northeast, which is vulnerable to cold weather. So although changes in spot prices tend to be more limited, the pass through to retail consumers 
can happen quickly, okay? Moving on to natural gas, the heating demand is a big share of the overall uh, winter market for natural gas. So cold weather can cause big increases in spot prices, but the pass through from those wholesale markets to, uh, to retail markets happens relatively slowly. And that's why you see this, this relatively narrower or range here. And then finally, we have electricity. The, the heating demand is a relatively small share of the overall market. And that's in part because we use electricity for to meet other demands, right? It's not only even for households that use electricity for heating, they're not only using it for heating, they're using it for lighting and for uh, other appliances. So the baseline level of consumption is, is going to be higher. And so the effect of a changing temperature is going to be relatively smaller. The other, the other thing is that though electricity markets vary across uh, the country, prices are generally slower to, to translate from wholesale to uh, retail uh, customers. And so you see this, this narrower range. Next slide. Okay, so I want to step through each of these fuels in a bit more detail, and we're going to start with uh, with natural natural gas. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to start with the U.S. average numbers that you see here. So we expect that nominal retail prices, and all of these percentages are compared with last winter. So on a nominal basis, we expect uh, retail prices to be up 22% compared with last winter. Because we expect a slightly colder winter, uh, consumption to be up 5%, and therefore total household expenditures for homes using natural gas to be up about 28%. The bar chart uh, below those percentages show the um, share of natural gas within each region. Uh, it's 46% overall, and it varies from 28% uh, in the south up to 64% in the, the Midwest. On the right hand side, you can see the regional breakdown in uh, changes in retail prices, consumption and expenditures. Again, this is on a nominal basis relative to last winter. And you can see that expenditures are expected to increase between 23 and 33%. Though you can't see it in the, in the, the uh, map here, on an absolute basis, uh, Household expenditures are higher in the Northeast, be highest in the Northeast because they have the highest unit prices and also in the Midwest because they have the highest uh, consumption levels. Uh, next, next slide. So natural gas prices are entering this, this uh, winter season near the highest level since uh, two, 2008. And there's a wide range of factors that are contributing to these high prices. But and I just want to illustrate a couple of those. One is that uh, natural gas use uh, in the electric sector is, is up. The figure you see on the left-hand side is showing natural gas use in the electric sector as measured by the capacity factor. Uh, if you're not familiar with that metric, it's just essentially a utilization percentage associated with the generators that are using natural gas. And it's actually up 5% relative to the same time last year, but that's against a backdrop where natural gas prices are double what they were at this time last year. And that's indicated on the, the right side of the figure. And historically, when we've had these kind of conditions where natural gas prices go very high, we've seen uh, coal substituted for uh, natural gas, but we're seeing less and less of that substitution for, for a few reasons. One is that we, we see continued retirement of uh, coal fire generating capacity, lower coal stocks at uh, coal fire power plants, and constraints on the delivery of coal to those facilities. So overall, we're seeing a relatively inelastic demand for uh, natural gas in, in the electric sector. Next slide. Another key element here is uh, natural gas exports. So what you see here are price trends uh, in the United States in blue. These are the, the Henry Hub prices. And then we also have price benchmarks shown here for Europe and Asia. And you see this really large price differential between domestic and international prices. And that's driven really high levels of LNG exports from the United States to these these international markets. And that's resulted in a relatively fixed source of demand for uh, domestically produced uh, nat natural gas. Next slide. 
Moving on, I want to talk a little bit about uh, natural gas uh, inventories. So here, what you see is the, the gray band represents the five-year range in working gas inventories. The dark gray line represents the five-year average. That dark red line represents the inventory level at a given point over the last few years. Uh, you can see that that vertical dotted line is where we move into forecast mode and the the lighter red line is showing our short-term energy outlook forecast for uh, inventory levels and then the dotted lines uh, represent the the weather cases where we again increase and decrease the the heating degree days which can exert a fairly significant um, impact in term, uh, you can see a very clear seasonal pattern. So we build inventories beginning usually in April through the end of, you know, end of October to, to early November and so that we have natural gas available through the winter heating season. Given the high levels of demand for natural gas that I, that I mentioned, you know, so in the electric sector for, for export, we're starting the winter heating season with inventory levels that are uh, below the, the five year um, the, the five year average. Um, you can see that with regard to our, our STO forecast that those those inventories will build over time. But if we have a significant a significantly uh, colder win, uh, winter, you can see that we're really going to have to draw on those inventories and we could dip below the five year range and, and begin to approach the record low that was set in March of uh, 2003. Next slide. Okay, this shows our projection of natural gas prices through the end of next year. So that light blue line is drawn from our short term energy outlook forecast for October. We're showing that we're also showing the NYMEX uh, futures strip as of October 6th. That's shown in the, the darker blue and you can see pretty good agreement between between the two. But the other thing I want to call attention to are these are, are the the green lines that represent the 95% confidence interval on the on the NYMEX prices and that's based those that confidence interval is based on the NYMEX data and and is is based on actual trades of futures and options contracts and what that tells us is that um the the people purchasing the, these contracts are expecting some volatility in the future, right? So we we have our trajectory, but there's a pretty wide range of potential price outcomes through the end of next year. The thing I want to emphasize, though, as I mentioned, is that pass through for natural gas to retail customers is relatively slow. So even if we have high volatility in wholesale natural gas markets, that doesn't immediately translate into um, high prices for for retail consumers. Next slide. Okay, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about electricity. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this uh, diagram should slide should look familiar. I, again, I'm going to start with US average. So we expect the nominal retail prices for electricity to be 6% higher this winter compared with last winter um, because of the expected colder winter, we expect we expect consumption to be up 4%. And so therefore overall household, household expenditures will be up about uh, 10% in our baseline forecast. Uh, you can see the share of electricity within each region. It ranges from a low of 17% in the Northeast up to a high of 65% uh, across the Southern uh, United States. Again, on the right hand side, we're showing the regional breakdown uh, of retail prices, consumption, and expenditures. These, pri these uh, percentages represent the change, again, compared to last winter in nominal terms. You can see that expenditures uh, in our baseline forecast range from plus eight to about 12% across, across the country. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, moving on, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, propane as well. Next slide. So on a U.S. average basis, we expect the nominal retail price to be about the same as it was last winter, but consumption to be up 5%, uh, again, given the colder expected winter, and expend expenditures to therefore be up uh, 5%. 5 you can see the, the regional share of propane, and um, it's highest in the Midwest at, at 8%. 
you can see the regional breakdown here. We expect uh, expenditures to range from you know plus four to plus eight percent. But again, remember that bar chart. There's a potentially wide range of outcomes depending on uh, the realized uh, temperature through the through the winter. Uh, next uh, next slide. Okay, so this is showing propane inventories. This graph is very similar to what I showed for natural gas. So same setup, the gray band represents the five-year range. The brown line represents the inventory levels at a given point in time over the last few years. Beyond the, the vertical dotted line uh, represents our forecast for both baseline as well as the um, uh, higher and lower heating degree days off of that baseline. Uh, with propane, we're entering the winter heating season close to the five-year average. Uh, again, weather will be key to inventory fo formation and propane prices uh, this, this winter. Under the base case, we expect a fairly typical seasonal draw of propane and that will end the winter in the middle of the five-year range. But again, if we have a colder winter, uh, we will draw on those inventories in a very significant way and we could actually end up uh, hitting a record low that was set in uh, March of, of 1993. So if we do have that colder weather, that's gonna place upward pressure on wholesale uh, propane prices. And as I mentioned earlier, those, those prices, increases in prices would be passed on to consumers uh, when they have to refill their, their tanks. So the pass through happens relatively uh, quickly. Next slide. Uh, this shows uh, propane inventories on a regional basis. So between the Midwest and the Gulf Coast, uh, they contain 80% of our, our national propane uh, inventory. And I just want to call attention to the Midwest where uh, currently inventories are about 9% below the five-year average. And so that's something we're keeping a close eye on. And I know that Rusty in his remarks uh, is, is going to talk more about the propane market for this winter. Next slide. Okay, and then one final thing on uh, propane. So in this graph, what we've done is taken propane as well as ultra low sulfur diesel prices, adjusted uh, the price based on their heat content and then normalized it by uh, crude oil prices. So what you end up with is sort of a dimensionless uh, price index. And so wherever the, the line is above the um, above one, that's indicating that the refined product is more expensive than crude oil and anywhere it's less than one, it indicates that refined product is uh, less expensive than uh, crude oil. And we have oil prices entering the winter he heating season at similar levels to what they were last winter. And yet we see diverging trends in these ratios over the past year, even with the you know, similar cr uh, crude prices. The diesel spot prices are higher than they were a year ago, while propane prices are lower. So with regard to propane, those prices are about 50 cents per gallon lower than they were at this time uh, last year. And that's due in part to the fact that propane inventory levels are higher now than they were at the same time last year. And that in turn is due to the, in part to the fact that natural gas production is higher. So we've had uh, more production of propane at uh, natural gas plants. And, and uh, one important thing to recognize here that this value of propane being below the, the crude oil price is, is actually uh, where it has been historically. So that represents a return to normal. But you see these elevated uh, diesel prices and um, that's really due to the tight international market for distillate fuel. Uh, so there's some really interesting and complicated dynamics around um, price formation for these, for these commodities. Uh, next slide. Okay, and then finally, heating oil. Next slide. Uh, again, the heating oil is being used predominantly in the Northeast. So here we're just going to show the, the U.S. average numbers, which apply to the Northeast. We expect that the nominal retail price compared to last winter will be up 16%. Uh, consumption will be up 9%. And overall household expenditures compared to last winter will be up 27%. Again, the predominant use of fuel oil is in the uh, the northeastern uh, U.S. Next slide. 
Uh, this plot shows uh, nominal heating oil prices uh, over over the last three years, uh, or, or I'm sorry, two years. And there's three components to these prices. One is the price of crude oil. The second is the wholesale margin, which represents the difference between the crude oil price and the price at which refiners sell the fuel. And then finally, you have the retail margin and, and taxes. With respect to crude oil prices, we expect that they'll generally remain near their current levels through this winter. And that's due to the, our expectation that global markets will re remain relatively balanced between uh, supply and, and demand. Of course, as I, I mentioned, you know, the, the possibility for volatility is, is quite high. Uh, refining margins, though, we expect to remain above the five-year average in the coming quarters because of tight supplies and global dissolute markets. So we expect that retail uh, heating oil prices to average about $4.50 per gallon this winter, which is up 16% uh, compared to last winter on a, on a nominal basis. Next slide. This graph shows distillate fuel inventories on the East Coast, which is which is pad one, uh, and that this includes uh, heating oil. And what's notable about this is that we're starting the winter heating season almost 50% below the five year average. Okay, and uh, inventories uh, in pad one are low for a couple of reasons. One is that there's been a reduction in refining capacity, in particular. In 2019, we had the closure of the Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery, which was one of the largest in the region. And there's also been a reduction in distillate fuel imports amid reductions in global distillate supplies. We expect these factor, the, the factors that led to this current low inventory situation to persist, and that's going to limit downward pressure on distillate uh, fuel refining margins and, and again can contribute to high price uh, volatility. Next slide. So that wraps up uh, a summary of our winter fuels outlook. I do want to mention that we're going to update the tables associated with the outlook throughout the winter on a monthly basis. Our website has a lot more information on each of these winter heating fuels, so please check out our website. I also wanted to call attention to a couple of our dashboards. So we have a New England dashboard that gives a lot of information about natural gas and electricity supply and prices into New England. And then we also have a natural gas storage dashboard that gives a lot of good information about um, gas storage around around the United States. Next slide. And this is just a list of some of our key products, which I, I wanted to include for reference. And with that, I will turn it back over to Hannah. All right, thanks, Joe. I appreciate it. Um, just a quick note, <clears throat> excuse me, I've seen a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and yes, we are going to make these presentations available on our website following the event. Okay, so with that said, I will turn things over to Rusty. Yep. All right, Hannah, can you uh, can you see the presentation? I can see your presentation, and I can I can hear you as well. That's even better. <laughs> All right, so uh, so thanks a lot, Hannah and uh, EIA, for asking me to join you again this year. Uh, uh, you know, let's see, do it. Did I get my Did I get my camera on? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if Your I can do that. camera's not on. No. Uh, that, that, that's all right. Um, so, uh, you, you know, we always like to use classic rock songs as a theme for my presentation. So this time, uh, it is uh, it is Born to be Wild. Uh, that's Steppenwolf, 1968, for any of you who were around back then. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a theme that's not necessarily uh, about what the natural gas and the propane markets, which is what I'm going to talk about, Really have in store for us this winter, but you know you never know. Uh, but here I'm really talking about where we sit with all energy markets. You know, it's a whole different kind of market turmoil uh, than we've uh, ever seen before. Uh, we've got a hot war in Europe. We've got sky high prices. We've got Russia's use uh, of energy as a weapon. We're still recovering from uh, a global pandemic. Uh, our markets are absorbing massive new energy transition initiatives. The economy is shaky, recession could be just around the corner, national politics are wacky, uh, and producer discipline has basically reset the shale supply curve. So if that ain't wild, I don't know what is. So let's just consider what, uh, what that kind of volatility has done to our energy markets over the past couple of years. 
uh, way back in uh, 2021, Mount Bellevue propane was down to 75 cents a gallon. That was back in April. We were concerned about what was going to happen to inventory. Inventories prices ran up to a buck fifty, uh, then collapsed back down to 90 cents. That didn't last long. Uh, uh, March propane was back to a dollar sixty in response to Ukraine uh, and uh, and colder weather. Uh, and since then, the price drifted off and then dropped like a rock over the course of the past uh, couple of weeks uh, down to the uh, mid 80s or so. So a lot of that price roller coaster has been in sympathy for the price behavior of other energy commodities like oil. Of course, we all know what these numbers have done over the past couple of years. Geopolitics spiked crude oil up to uh, 120 after the initial Ukraine invasion again in June uh, before drifting back down to the 80s. But still about, or that I guess high 80s, but still about where we were this time last year, which was below 80s. Uh, and then the really crazy market, natural gas. Uh, Joe showed a version of this. Henry Hub gas uh, increasing from 250 last year up to six bucks in the fall, then bouncing between five dollars and nine dollars cents. A lot of that volatility has been on the back of much higher natural gas exports in the form of LNG. A lot of that going to Europe, uh, and the price differential between Europe and uh, uh, U.S. has been off the scale. So we just changed the scale uh, on this graphic to show just exactly what's happened. Uh, and, and of course, the uh, the, the, the uh, TTF uh, price has just gone uh, gone bonkers uh, uh, up to uh, hundred dollars in MB, MMBTU um, a uh, uh, a couple of months back, uh, back down to you know in the 40s, 50s uh, now. But uh, gosh, if you're an exporter and you can get net gas from the Gulf Coast of Europe, you are printing money right now. And of course, that means that dock capacity is maxed out, except for the uh, Freeport outage, the uh, LNG terminal that is uh, offline right now. And then we've also got some maintenance going on at the Cove Point LNG facility. So the implication of all of this is that natural gas stocks uh, are not building quite as fast as some of the market uh, would uh, like to see. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's got implications for the market that we'll look at in a minute. Uh, these graphs uh, shows how uh, show how production has responded to those moves. This is crude oil, 13.1 uh, million barrels a day back before COVID, dropped like a rock uh, down to 11 million barrels a day, where it stayed for over a year, continually getting whacked by hurricanes and the February deep freeze uh, last year. Then, past two years, uh, production has clawed its way back uh, to 12 million barrels a day, uh, uh, but still 8%. Uh, oh, uh, uh, April, eight percent off the peak, and it's hardly budged in the last six months, just hanging right there at that 12 million barrels a day. Uh, same time frame for propane, uh, down about a million barrels a day after COVID, uh, but after that, moving higher, except for winter storm Uri. Uh, now, NGL production is about 20 percent higher than it was before COVID, and as you might expect, a lot of that volume is coming from the Permian. But if crude oil production is flat and propane is up 20%, how exactly could that work? And of course, the answer is natural gas. Uh, lower 48 natural gas production uh, fell uh, after the initial COVID outbreak, but only fell from about 95 down to 85 BCF, about 10% or so. Then it started to come back, interrupted by the hurricanes, interrupted by the deep freeze for sure. But now it's popped all the way back to 100 BCF uh, for uh, several days over the past couple of weeks, an all-time record. Uh, obviously, the, the takeaway there uh, is that natural gas is growing faster than crude oil production, and that's both because of solid growth out of the Haynesville and the Permian, with the Permian getting an added boost because of an increasing gas to crude oil ratio. And it's that rich Permian gas that's coming on faster than crude oil that's responsible for most of the production increase uh, that you see there in NGLs in general and propane in particular. So as we look toward the winter of 2022-2023, that uh, uh, propane and natural gas production growth is certainly good for the markets, but there's a catch. Uh, a lot of that incremental uh, supply is going into overseas markets, and uh, you know that's one of the most important issues 
that's going to be uh, involved in the winter supply demand balance for these fuels uh, along with production and inventory. So let's let's take a look at those uh, inventory numbers. Uh, well, first, sorry. First of all, we'll look at uh, we'll look at the uh, uh, what just what propane exports have done over the past few years. Then we get to inventory. Um, so this is where those exports have been coming from uh, over the last decade. Gulf Coast uh, exports from uh, Enterprise and Targa, Energy Transfer and P66, uh, up from about 150,000 barrels a day in 2012 to 1.1 million barrels a day last year to 1.2 million barrels a day so far this year. Uh, East Coast, uh, mostly out of Energy Transfer, Marcus Hook, zero in 2012, 50,000 barrels a day in 2018. Uh, now up to 170,000 barrels, uh, going to be growing more next year. Uh, and that export growth has increased the percentage uh, of production moving to export markets, that's on the right scale there, from 15% back in 2012 to 66% today. In other words, two-thirds of all the production volumes uh, of propane in the U.S., are moving into uh, international markets. That's a far larger number than the total consumer demand in the United States. So it's no wonder that international markets can have a much bigger impact on the total level of NGL uh, prices in the United States than anything that can happen, anything that happens in this country. Of course, uh, what's happening in those international markets is the triple whammy of war and sanctions and energy shortages. So it shouldn't be any surprise that the uh, big volumes of U.S. propane are going to Europe, uh, up about 70% so far this year, given the situation with Russian gas. Uh, when it gets cold, uh, Europeans might be looking to burn anything to stay warm. And so if they start buying a lot more U.S. propane, uh, the only question is how much can they get into their markets on relatively short notice. Obviously, uh, uh, the majority of that incremental supply will be coming uh, from the U.S., uh, and that would most likely happen right in the middle of the winter propane season. Uh, so that has a lot to, uh, could have a big influence on inventories. So now let's take a look at what those inventories uh, might look at. We'll start here with, uh, with Pad 1, uh, East Coast numbers. Um, uh, the uh, Pad 1, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, volumes going into Europe. Uh, the good news is that uh, those exports have actually been coming off a little bit lately, as you can see in that graph. More European volumes have been coming from the Gulf Coast. That's pretty much what we could expect this time of year. It's an important factor in basically keeping the local supply-demand uh, balance in check. Uh, and here's how we see those inventories playing out. Uh, the gray area, again, uh, similar to what Joe was showing, five-year high-low range. Blue line is last year. Uh, and this is our outlook for uh, this year uh, and and, uh, and uh, the, uh, part of the winter for in the next year. Bottom line here is we think that Pad 1 uh, inventories for propane will be in relatively decent shape, uh, basically in the middle of the five-year range, as long as exports hang in there on the low end of the range, and of course with propane, as long as we don't get any severe uh, weather events. As usual, the, the region that we're worried most about is Pad 2. Uh, uh, the issue uh, is not only weather, but also here supply. Uh, less propane is coming in via rail from Canada due to a lot more volumes, over 100,000 barrels a day, moving to Asia uh, from new ter relatively new terminals in British Columbia. And as we speak, another 22,000 barrels a day of Canadian propane is going to be sucked into interpipelines, Heartland Propane Dehydrogenation Facility uh, in Alberta. That's the picture that you see there. All of that supply has got to be replaced from somewhere, and a lot of it will come from the trading hub at Conway, Kansas. Unfortunately, uh, Conway has had problems of its own uh, with a fractionator, One Oaks Medford Fractionator, had a fire back in July. Uh, as a result, uh, we are projecting. Where's my projections? There we go. Uh, we are projecting relatively low inventories for Pad 2, uh, riding along the bottom of the five-year range this winter. Not much different uh, than what it was last year, as long as we don't get a big weather surprise. So the market ought to look okay. Uh, but anything outside of normal weather 
uh, could certainly be a problem for this region. And pad three. Uh, oops. No. Uh, Gulf Coast. Uh, this is a graph of U.S. monthly average waterborne exports for propane since 2019, ramping up from about 1.1 million barrels a day back then to 1.3, 1.5 today. Most of that's coming out of the Gulf Coast. Uh, the good news uh, is that production growth has been increasing, and that has meant that uh, Pad 3 inventories has uh, recovered over the past over the summer months after being at the low end of the range for the previous year. Uh, the dash red and blue lines show our Pad 3 inventory projections for this year, pretty much in the middle of a five-year range. Again, uh, the variables being imports and weather, but giving the low level of consumer demand in Pad 3, this region is going to be in better shape. Uh, that uh, that it certainly was uh, versus last year. Sorry about that. I uh, can't forget uh, about uh, pads four and pads five uh, in the Rockies. Uh, inventories look to be in very good shape again this year, uh, well above the average inventory levels for the past five years. Uh, on the other hand, Pacific Northwest and Southwest, things could be a little skinny uh, uh, on the West Coast. Uh, refinery supplies are down uh, due to outages and closures. Uh, lower supplies coming in from Canada, again, because of those British Columbia ex uh, exports and PDH issues that we're looking at earlier. Uh, so uh, that could put stocks in this market uh, below the five-year low. It's going to take a lot of rail cars from other parts of the country to keep this market supplied. Uh, but even with the concerns for Pad 2 and Pad, uh, pad 5, overall uh, this year the propane market is in much better shape uh, than it was uh, last year. Uh, we're projecting total propane inventories to be essentially right in the middle of the five-year range through the most of the winter season, uh, which is above last year. Uh, uh, so uh, last year making a new low for the range. So, uh, so. You know, frankly, it's uh, it's quite a bit more healthy than uh, than we were looking at uh, when we looked at the numbers last year. But it's propane, and that means uh, don't get cocky. Uh, we talked to a lot of folks in the propane industry to understand how they are preparing for the propane season, and understand that it's not quite as comfortable as the statistics might have us believe. So to wrap up on propane, I'll leave you with the words from a wise old sage propane buyer. Uh, on a call that I had with him a little earlier in this week. Uh, he basically said, with inventories and production the way they are, uh, looking at the numbers that we just looked at, uh, if it was five years ago, I wouldn't have a care in the world. But it's not five years ago. Uh, there's a potential problem, and it's not at the major inventory hubs where we're looking at these statistics. It's downstream. It's the, the last mile, or more accurately, the last hundred miles. Uh, given the shortage of crews with the railroads, the extended delivery times, the cutbacks and switches from two or three from daily to two or three times a week, and the difficulty in finding truck drivers for long haul propane transport carriers, we are preparing for the worst this winter. This comment uh, and others that we've heard like it really enforces the importance of planning, logistics, customer support, everything that it takes to make sure that the supply chain is, uh, is very resilient depending on what happens because you can never take anything for granted when you're preparing for these winter fuel markets. Uh, which uh, get you, gets me to the other winter fuel market that uh, I was going to address today, uh, and that is natural gas. So uh, like we started with, uh, natural gas production is up, hitting all-time highs over the course of the past couple of weeks. But again, let's not get too comfortable because a lot of that incremental production is going to LNG exports. Exports uh, are, are not anywhere near uh, propane 66%, uh, but uh, LNG feed gas is now, it's a light green area, a light blue area you're seeing there, is up to about 11% of production, and that's not counting pipeline exports to Mexico. So exports are becoming a lot bigger deal for the market, and that's a trend that's not going to be slowing down anytime soon. Which means anytime there's a blip uh, in uh, export markets, it can have a material impact 
own short-term supply-demand balances. That's exactly what we've seen this year. We were sailing toward, you know, 13 BCF uh, of LNG feed gas in the fourth quarter of this year, which have really would have tightened up the market when the Freeport terminal fire happened. Uh, that cut uh, two BCF out of the market about four months ago. Uh, and instead of going on ships, these volumes went into inventory, effectively giving the market a reprieve for this uh, for this year. Uh, today, uh, LNG demand is down even more during the, due to the annual uh, outage at Cove Point. Uh, so, again, the market is in much better shape at 11 BCF feed gas versus what it would have been with 13 BCF feed gas. But, again, we can't get too comfortable because Freeport will be coming back on in, on, in November, and there's other things going on uh, that uh, are tightening up the market as well. Uh, this is a uh, graphic that uh, really is going to get to one of the other points that Joe made a few minutes ago, uh, and it's where we compare what happened this year to last year, in this case, April through October of 22 versus 21. Supply is up, production's up by 3.4 million barrels a day, Canadian imports up by another 0.8 BCF a day. And of course, uh, some of that increase in supply is going to exports, 0.3 incremental increase to Mexico, 0.9 BCF incremental increase to LNG exports. But where did all the rest of that gas production go? Well, yeah, it went to power. The expensive coal and hot weather sucked a lot of gas uh, into the power generation market, 3.3 BCF over last year. Residential commercial demand was up, was slightly below last year, while industrial was up some. But put all that together, and the market balances out the way we look at this time period, period pretty close to last year. But remember, for this to happen, report was offline. So things would not have been nearly as balanced if not for the report outage. So uh, again, this is uh, uh, the story that, uh, uh, that Joe told. Uh, power burn uh, it has been a big deal uh, so far this year. It's going to be a big deal to watch this winter because it is uh, at least 6% over last year, both summer and winter. It's going to stay that way all the way through this winter. Ukraine war is still on. No doubt coal prices are going to stay strong. Uh, so the economics of power generation for natural gas are going to stay high. So that means with gas, we've got to look at production with exports. We've got to look at exports. We've got to look at the classic winter supply demand swings, and we've got to look at power burn in the winter as, as far as trying to understand what's going to happen this year. That said, though, you put it all together, and we think the market's going to cooperate over the next few weeks, uh, getting uh, the natural gas inventories up to about 3.5 uh, TCF uh, for the end of the fill season, which is uh, just under the five-year average, just under last year's, pretty close to industry expectations. Um, so, but just like with propane, uh, all the variables have to cooperate there, and if they do, we'll get through the winter of 22-23 in good shape. But also like propane, there is a potential gotcha here, and that gotcha is in Louisiana. So uh, this is uh, the South Louisiana, uh, uh, the locations that you see on the slide there, uh, of the Henry Hub. Uh, Gillis, which is the, uh, the, the most significant uh, supply point for LNG facilities uh, in Louisiana, and the three facilities that are owned now, Sabine Pass, Cameron, and the new startup at Calcasieu Pass, the volumes out of these facilities made up 60% of U.S. LNG exports before the Freeport fire. After the fire took Freeport out, 70% uh, since then. And there's another couple of terminals we've got on that slide, including that are going to be coming on uh, over the next few years, Golden Pass, and then Driftwood, assuming Driftwood uh, gets their financing challenges resolved, or perhaps somebody else uh, buys and builds the facility. But that, that's a story for another day. Uh, what's clear here is that a lot of the gas that's flowing into those export volumes has come from, by displacement, from, uh, from the gas that would have been going into Freeport. So again, uh, we think there's a good chance that the Freeport fire, as painful as it has been for 
folks at Freeport and for uh, the and for their customers actually helped the U.S. Uh, dodge uh, a bullet this summer, meaning much higher prices that we could have seen this summer uh, if Freeport had have been online. So uh, this is because uh, a lot of the gas that that feeds uh, the LNG facilities in South Louisiana uh, that we extend over and kind of include Port Arthur in that just across the border as well uh, whenever Golden Pass comes on. It's coming from northern Louisiana and east Texas, uh, either from the Haynesville or from east uh, or from inflows in the northern tier of Louisiana uh, from Texas or from the eastern side uh, of the U.S. from the Appalachia into the Perryville hub. There's a lot of new pipeline projects. They either have been built, are being built, or will be built. Uh, we're showing here on this slide uh, that uh, that are going to are going to bring gas and have been bringing that gas uh, down into South Louisiana. Uh, uh, but uh, but all of these uh, pipelines are coming on just as soon as uh, they uh, they were expected to be. So this shows our outlook for. LNG uh, for demand and for outflows out of South Louisiana, most of those outflows going into Florida and the Southeast Atlantic states. This is our total of supply uh, that can meet that demand, Louisiana and offshore production plus inflows into the states. And what you can see here is that we've been on the ragged edge of the supply demand balance issue in that region, in the Southeast Louisiana region, uh, all this year, and it would have been much tighter if not for Freeport. Now that's going to ease up next year when more pipelines in, in these corridors are completed and uh, more production continues to come online. Uh, uh, but uh, what, what really matters is that the Henry Hub is right there in the middle of all of this. So when gas gets tight in and around this area, uh, it gets tight at Henry, uh, and that affects everything that, since that is where all of the outright prices get set for all U.S. basis points. The implication is that uh, if the market uh, around the Henry Hub gets constrained, it could do very strange things uh, to uh, regional market prices, uh, hedging strategies, and basically the way that NGL export facilities are supplied. So just like uh, the old Sage's comments back in propane, don't get too comfortable uh, with the, uh, the natural gas market statistics either. Uh, the market ought to be fine for this year, but it wouldn't take much to throw a monkey wrench into things. And with that happy note, Hannah, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Rusty. Um, so now we're going to turn to a Q&A. Um, and so let's start off uh, just following up on the, the natural gas that Rusty was just discussing. I've got a question here for Karina. Um, what is the peak natural gas usage in BCF per day this winter? And how does that compare to the recent increase in production? Thanks, Hannah. Um, so I don't know the specific numbers off the top of my head without looking them up, but this question gets at a um, key point as to what's been driving natural gas prices. Um, and that is that, um, yes, we have seen an increase in U.S. production of natural gas. In fact, in 2021, it reached a record and in general has continued to increase in 2022. But the other side to that equation is um, U.S. demand for natural gas, which has also been increasing um, and has exceeded U.S. supply of natural gas, which has led to this situation um, for much of the year. We've seen graphs on this from Rusty and, and from Joe, where for much, much of this year, inventories of natural gas have been below their um, recent five-year averages. Um, and when that happens, that tends to put upward pressure on natural gas prices. Um, so I think that's really what this question is getting at, that um, U.S. consumption of and demand for natural gas has been exceeding the um, recent increase in supply. Great, thank you, Karina. Um, moving over to Matt with a question on heating oil prices. Um, <clears throat> the average US heating oil price increase is expected to be about 19%, um, but on slide 36, it says prices could be up as much as 40%. Could, could you focus in specifically on the New England prices and talk about what's happening there, Matt?
Matt, you might still be on mute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? There now? you go. Yeah. Uh, I got my Great. video going, but I forgot to turn the uh, unmute myself. Um, uh, so speaking of New England uh, heating oil prices, um, we do have a specific outlook, and Joe touched on a lot of these points earlier in the presentation uh, for a Pad One or East Coast uh, distillate inventories, uh, which are right now low, and we expect them to continue to be low. Um, in terms of specific. Uh, New England prices or expenditures, uh, we just forecast the national level, um, but speaking more broadly uh, about the New England uh, region, uh, I mentioned the low inventories, um, imports of diesel fuel are also low. Um, first half of 2022 versus first half of 2021 is down about 40%. Uh, and so that's just reflecting sort of the tightness in the overall Atlantic basin. Um, and, and that's related to Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine, demand increasing from Europe. Um, so there's just a general tightness in the Atlantic basin. Uh, and also in looking at the, the New England region, um, and also uh, something that Joe spoke to earlier is a limited refining capacity. Uh, the PES refinery is shut down. Uh, and so that was, I think it was about 335,000 barrel day uh, capacity refinery. So it's a, a good size refinery for supplying that specific region with distal fuel. Uh, and so now, you know, they're relying on, on other regions to get that and also on imports. Um, but it is a, it's a very tight market right now. Um, so that's, I think covers, I, I could talk about uh, some of the wholesale margins and retail margins as well. Um, if we, if we want to get into that as well. Uh, no, I think that that was great, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, can, can I um, follow up on that real quick? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I Happen. think that just one of the things to keep in mind when we were looking at these comparisons is that the um, the nineteen percent um, was was inflation adjusted. That was in that 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 was in real terms, um, and so that was you know that's our baseline forecast for heating oil expenditure increases this winter. Um, in in real terms, in nominal terms, that's 27%, and that difference between 27% and 40% is the is the 10% colder um, winter um, case. So that's that that's kind of that's what that range is 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 describing there. And also on the the New England specifically, we will. Um, later today, we'll be updating our shop prices um, on the on, on EIA's shop page, which we'll have. We don't have a forecast for New England specifically, but there is, you know, weekly updates on actual state level price data that um, that that people can look to on, on our shop page. Yeah, that's great, Tim. Thanks. And thanks for clar making that clarifying point about the nominal versus real. Can you stay on, Tim? Because I I'd like you to also sort of clarify what we see happening with um, propane expenditures this this coming winter. I, I'm worried that some folks might get confused depending on if they're looking at the chart showing the prices of the 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 expenditure estimates in real versus nominal, whether that's going up or down. So can you can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. So I and I think that that, that is something that um well I Although I think it adds extra explanatory detail to this year's out, outlook, um, it's the first time we've really added anything on on real prices in this deck. Um, and we we tried to generally, if we were comparing winter over winter, to 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 mostly put it in nominal terms. But if we showed graphs on expenditures or um, prices that went back over the course of several winters or a decade, to to state those in real terms. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's that's a a place where people could, um, where where you could get some mixed signals on what we're reporting there on the propane side, and it is that you know our average propane expenditures across the three regions that we report on the the, the south, the Midwest, and and the Northeast are expected to be up five percent this year on a nominal basis, but you know, inflation um, in our forecast on the winter average, and this is based on forecasts from S&P Global, 
um, and and using the CPI is is running between six and seven percent winner over winner. So you know those expenditures, any expenditures we're reporting in nominal terms, you know, adjusted for inflation would be, you know, um, the increase, the year over year increase would be six to seven percent less. So you know, in terms of propane, if we adjust for inflation, it's actually down um, two percent. Um, so, I mean, again, this is more of a, the way we report it, that the, the actual expenditures for this winter, the same, no matter how the, the actual absolute level of expenditures are the same, no matter how you report it. It's just the, the change versus last winter when adjusting for inflation, um, gives you a little different change. Yes. Okay. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, so our next question is, um. One for David, um, does the above average precipitation in winter translate to increased snow cover? Not necessarily because um, the increased precipitation could come at a period in time, you know, there's weather variability, obviously, and if it occurs when the temperature is above freezing, then it's not going to go into snow. So, no, you can't make that assumption. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is one for for Josh. Um, can you talk a bit about why retail propane prices in the Northeast are higher than in other regions? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so historically, prices and typically prices in the Northeast are um, a bit higher because uh, from wholesale to retail, um, mostly because if you think about transportation costs, um, so our major benchmark spot price uh, in the Northeast is Selkirk, New York. Uh, when that price spread is wide enough compared to Gulf Coast prices, the spot prices uh, at Mount Bellevue, uh, we'll see product going from the Gulf Coast uh, to the Northeast via the Topco pipeline. Uh, and with that, you get a tariff that's added on and the cost of that tariff is uh, you know, passed down from the wholesale uh, level to the retail level. Uh, and when the price at Selkirk gets even higher, uh, we'll actually see product coming from a uh, by boat from the Atlantic Basin uh, places, uh, mostly in North Africa, West Africa, or Northwest Europe. Uh, we'll see this come in to uh, the import terminals in New England. Uh, those have associated costs as well that gets passed on. Um, and when you compare that to the Midwest, which uh, as Rusty was was talking about at Conway, uh, most of the propane at Conway is, uh, you know, is getting produced from uh, places in the West, and they're mostly trying to keep their propane uh, from going down to the Gulf Coast. So that's the cost associated with that, but it's not as much as those uh, transportation costs uh, trying to pull product over to the East Coast. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so our next question is an electricity related one. So maybe Tyler, if you could speak to this, um, 1 of our audience members says it looks. Like that on average homes heating with electricity will have lower costs this winter than those that use natural gas. Is this correct? And is this because those heating sources are popular in warmer climates? Or does that comparison hold within the same region? Um, hi, well, thanks for the question. That, that's actually. Pretty interesting question, um, but given the forecasts that we're putting out, I, I would actually kind of caution against um, comparing the levels of expenditures across the different fuels, because uh, as was mentioned earlier, what we're projecting includes um, expenditures for all types of uses. So, like in particular for electricity, you're you're um, you're comparing the like the total uses, including lighting and the cost to run your refrigerator um, versus like heating uh, for natural gas, which was mentioned earlier, really does peak in the winter. So, um, and so it, I guess that is a good point though, that there is a lot of variability in terms of the different efficiencies of heating uh, for different fuels. Um, as was mentioned in the South, um, that's primarily where you see a lot of heating for electricity, uh, whereas natural gas is used more across the, the country. 
uh, but within even within a specific region, there's there's a lot of variability between the different types of uh, heating sources. Um, so you might have some um, households that still use the old resistance type of heating, which can be pretty inefficient uh, and expensive. Uh, whereas some homes might have like a modern geothermal heating system, which can be very cheap to, to heat with. Uh, and likewise with natural gas, there's a lot of variability in um, uh, the different types of heating too. So, so again, I, I would just caution against um, comparing the different levels. What's really more important is really kind of comparing uh, the winter over winter growth rates. So Excellent. hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Tyler, while you're here, oh, Tim, you want to? Oh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to. Add, I wanted to add to that. I think the I, I, I'm I'm inferring here, but I think that the question was related to the the um, the slide that showed the the different the the baseline expenditure change and then the the, the changes across the cases, and the the electricity expenditure change is less. This winter compared with last winter, than the natural gas change. But you know, if and I don't know that we showed it anywhere in this report, but our, our report online shows that you know absolute electricity expenditures are higher than natural gas um, expenditures pretty much across all the regions. Again, call, all the same caveats that Tyler just mentioned that it, it's not you know it's the winter over winter change you should look at the most, but because of those extra fuel uses for, or extra um, end uses for electricity, um, you, you do have higher higher absolute bills on average. It's just the change is less this winter. Okay, that's a good point, thanks. Um, and so Tyler, another, another question for you. Um, so wholesale power prices have grown substantially in the past year. What effect do you expect that to have on electric bills this winter? Uh, well, yeah, that's that's definitely a good point to uh, mention is that the wholesale power prices, those have really kind of been in the news because uh, that's where you've been seeing a lot of um, spikes essentially in uh, prices. Um, that's true not just this year, but last year. Uh, wholesale power prices have increased like from 30% up to nearly doubling or tripling in some cases in some regions. But it, it's important to remember that the wholesale power prices are uh, a, a spot price measure of like the supply and demand balance at a given point in time in the electricity market. And it, it really measures the the price of the highest cost marginal generator to produce power. Uh, but on the retail side, obviously the retail distributors have to pass through all the costs that they incur in terms of supplying the electricity to end use customers. Uh, so that includes not just like the power price that um, they purchase on the market with the wholesale power prices, uh, but also the cost of generating electricity in some cases. Um, and again, uh, there's all sorts of prices, including not just generation and purchase prices, but transmission costs. So it's really kind of like the average cost, not necessarily the marginal cost that's being passed through to retail customers. Um, so that's why generally the wholesale price changes are a bit more exaggerated than you would see in the retail market. Um, and then it's been mentioned earlier, there's obviously the lag in terms of how quickly these costs are passed through to customers. So hopefully that answers the question. I think you're on mute, Hannah. Thank you, Tyler. Um, so this next question is for Rusty. Uh, Rusty, do you think that NYMEX forwards are effectively pricing in the impact of resumed operations at Freeport? And do you expect um, continued production growth to offset this? Um, gosh, you never know what uh, what NYMEX is pricing in, you know. So I'm not really for sure. Uh, but uh, but my sense is when Freeport comes on. It is going to be increasing demand at right at the same time we would expect weather to be increasing demand as well. 
So I don't know. I, I guess I, I guess maybe the answer to your question would be I wouldn't want to be short going into the winter. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and do you have a view on sort of how increased exports of LNG to Europe are affecting prices in the United States? Well, uh, you know, kind of the, what I was talking about is uh, if if Freeport had been on, I, I think we would have seen double digit uh, natural gas prices this summer. Uh, Freeport wasn't on, and so it didn't get that bad. As uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So as uh, with with Freeport coming back on, uh, I, I think there's going to be an impact. Thank you. Um, this next question um, could be for Tim or maybe for Matt. Um, in the presentation, we saw that the U.S. oil production is forecasted to be around 12 million barrels per day. Uh, what do we think is limiting oil production from increasing even further? So I'll put that's out to. I don't know if Tim or Matt or Karina who, who wants to kind of chime in here. Matt, I mean, go, uh, go ahead if you have anything on that. But. Uh, just uh, some of like the, the general uh, things that we've been seeing on, you know, uh, decreasing ducts, uh, inventories of those have come down a lot, the drilled but uncompleted wells. Uh, so they kind of work as a uh, inventory for producers to sort of bring on production pretty quick. So right now, those duck inventories are pretty low. They've leveled off. Uh, sorry, the recount has also leveled off now since about mid July. Uh, it was increasing. So that recount, the, the growth is increasing or, or been flat now for several months. Um, so there's a number of things like that. Uh, I've seen some trade press reports. I just about some tightness in terms of uh, the crew availability to drill wells as well. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Tim. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that pretty much covers it. I think that, you know, what we've seen are just fewer rig additions at these price levels than probably, you know, than certainly we've seen in, in kind of the past decade. So um, I think there's, there's probably a fairly wide re range of reasons why that that could be happening. And I think a lot of it is, 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 you know, for, for us in terms of like, we try to focus on serve on survey data, um, somewhat, um, somewhat anecdotal evidence, but, you know, I think what Matt's saying about um, labor and input costs are, are true and just general, general capital allocation towards, you know, drilling programs, um, is, is less than it has been at, at these price levels. These price levels in the past. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. So we are approaching time. I wanted to thank our EIA panelists for answering the questions. And I wanted to give a, a really special thank you to David and Joe and Rusty for sharing their thoughts on, on how this winter might shape up. Thank you all for attending. Um, as we mentioned before, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website, as will the slide presentations. Uh, we thank you very much for participating and I hope you have a great day. Thanks.